Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jude. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's okay. We have some in the chair racks in front of you. Let me encourage you to take advantage of the fact that they are there and join us by reading uh, our text together this morning. If you are looking for the book of Jude, it's relatively easy to find. Go to the very back of your Bible, find the book of Revelation, go to chapter 1, then turn left one page, and you found it. That's our text for this morning. Though only one chapter in some of our Bibles, though only one page, the the book of Jude is jam-packed, and though we could spend several weeks on this letter, we'll only be looking at it today, which means uh, we're doing a broad overview. We're not doing a deep dive. We simply won't have time to explain everything, but Lord willing, we'll at least hit uh, the main points of the writer. As you are finding our text, it is good for us to remember that the psalmist says, Blessed is the man or blessed is the woman that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But instead, his and her delight, his and her joy, his and her love is in the law of the Lord. It's in the law of the Lord that he meditates, and he does so day and night. And as a result, she is like a tree that is planted by rivers of water. Her leaves will not wither. His fruit will come in due season. And whatsoever she and whatsoever he does, in it they will prosper. So let us pray this morning that we will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but instead let's run to Jesus. And let us not stand in the way of sinners, but instead let's be moved closer to Christ. And let's not sit in the seat of the scornful, but instead let's rest in the arms of our Savior. But to do so, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So will you pray with me? And let's ask God to bless our time together. Gracious and loving and approachable God, like unpacking the just back from vacation station wagon or minivan of our childhood, we each entered the sanctuary this morning with our baggage in tow. Through the doors we entered, bringing our questions, we bring our anxiety, we bring our sin, we bring all our pain, we bring all our anger, we bring our happiness and our joy. We bring in those things that everyone knows about, and we bring those things in which we hide and tuck away deep in the trunks and closets and basements of our soul, padlocked, believing that we only have the key. Some of us gave very little thought to coming this morning. It's part of our calendar. It's part of the rhythm of the week. It's just what we do. Others of us can't believe we're here, and we're wondering if this was a mistake or even if we might be able to slip away unnoticed. And some of us are here because our parents made us come. And some of us are here because it's our job. And some of us are here because we really, really want to be. Whatever it is, humanly speaking, that brought us and whatever baggage we brought in with us, may we come to understand, to know, and to honestly believe that in reality we're here because you arranged all things for us to be here this morning because you have something very important you want each and every one of us to know. You love us. No matter what is packed in our proverbial baggage, you love us. And you show us how much you love us through your gift of grace to us as seen in the person and life and work of your son, Jesus. So as the one who has gathered us, we pray that you would give us grace and the ears to hear your voice through the reading and preaching of your words. Speak, we pray, O Lord, for your servants listen. In Christ's name, amen. Jude. Beginning in verse 1, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, beloved. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. 
just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is probably not the letter they wanted to receive. You've probably had a communication like that before in your life. You receive the letter in the mail, you you see the return address, you see from whom it is written, and your initial response is one of excitement, but then you open it up, you pull out the letter, and you start to read. You were just going to clean out your inbox, and while scrolling through, you see a name that you haven't seen in a while. You see the first few lines of the email in your inbox. There's a sense of anticipation. You had just thought of this friend within the last few weeks, and you had thought about reaching out. And she beat you to it, evidently. So you click on the email, you read the first few lines, and suddenly you realize this was not the correspondence for which you were hoping. To be fair to the other side... At least according to verse 3 of Jude, this was not the letter he wanted to write either. And some of you have been on this side of it as well. You own a few rental houses and you like your tenants, but they're now behind several months on rent. And you have house notes to pay. So you are forced to send a communication, a letter letting them know that you cannot continue to defer the rent. It's not the letter you wanted to write or your child has been away at school and their grades have been slipping. You and your spouse have been patient. College, after all, is more difficult than high school, and your child's major is not one of the easier ones. But as the first semester is now over and there's an expectation and even an agreement that, that study habits would change and grades would be better, it's now pretty clear your child is not committed to fulfilling the rigors of their academic environment, and you're now faced with having a conversation about them coming home that you had really hoped you wouldn't have to have. But just because it's an unwanted communication, it doesn't mean that it's not needed Verse 3, Jude writes, Beloved. And as the original audience, you would read that greeting and perhaps you would stop and think to yourself, Beloved. Man, look at that, Jude. 
Jude has the same affection for me, for us, as, as we have for him. Beloved is the right word. I, I really miss Jude. Beloved, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. And again, you might think, yes, that phrase, that, that's what makes that relationship so valuable to me. Jude is one of those friends with, with whom you can go deep in part because of the salvation we share in Jesus Christ, of which we, we are both partakers. It's just a deeper bond than I have with other friends and acquaintances. And you pick up the letter again and you continue, Beloved, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. However, and there it is. There's that dreaded word, however. However, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And there you have it. This is not the letter Jude hoped to write. I would dare say it's not the letter the original audience hoped to receive. But neither of those take away from the fact that this is indeed a much needed letter. Verse, verse 4 tells us why. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. They're ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. It's an interesting fact about ungodly people. They're not always easy to identify. Some outright reject Jesus, and it usually doesn't take long to figure out who they are. But, but others? Others use God and use his name for their own personal gain and influence. And like carbon monoxide, these are hard to detect, but just as deadly. Did you know that every book in the New Testament except for one, the book of Philemon, contains a warning about false teachers? Let me repeat that. Every book in the New Testament except for one, the book of Philemon, contains a warning about false teachers. Jude is not talking about the guy on the corner with signs of doom and gloom and calling himself a prophet from another planet. No, the dangerous ones, like the best of counterfeit money, is often hard to spot. What they believe, what they teach, well, it sounds, it sounds right. But sounding right and being right are two drastically different things. The reason for Jude's concern, the reason he felt forced to write a letter he didn't want to send, but one he felt he must, is because false teachers, dangerous individuals who had cloaked themselves in the scent of Christianity, had crept in among the church. The people to whom Jude was writing, the people whom Jude called his beloved, are in danger. They are falling for the dangerous and distorted teachings of those whose gospel lectures are actually gospel-less. There you have it. It's a much-needed letter. And in this letter, the much-needed letter is a much-needed warning. A much-needed warning. The warning Jude gives begins with examples of the irreligious, people spoken of in the Bible and from Israel's past with whom the original audience would be familiar. Well, who are the irreligious? The irreligious are they who put themselves in the place of God. They are marked, their lives are marked by self-determination. They set themselves up as the determiners of right and wrong. And Jude gives three such examples. The first is found in verse 5. He's talking about those who rebelled in Israel's history. These were the Israelites in the wilderness who, though physically among the covenant community, refused to go into the promised land. They instead began to reminisce about the golden years of enslavement in Egypt. And from what little bit they had seen of the promised land of Canaan, well, it just seemed to be more trouble than it was worth. If that was what God's idea of blessing was, well, they had some better ideas. So they rebelled and refused to go into the land that God had promised. And Jude warns they were deserving of God's judgment. He then gives a second example. 
those that revolted. Prideful angels, he mentions in verse 6. We really, don't, we really know very little of the event itself, but, but these are the angels that rebelled against God. And because of pride in part, they refused their God-ordained positions of authority. And they sought more for themselves. In a similar way as that of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, they, they too wanted more for themselves. They wanted to be like God. Thus, Jude says, they were justifiably punished by God. And then to these first two examples, he adds a third group. A third group added to this warning of judgment. And it was those who reveled in self-determination. He mentions it in verse 7. Perhaps the most infamous of this trifecta, they were the collective individuals in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah who reserved for themselves to determine what was morally right and wrong and because of their own lusts and pride exhibited all sorts of immoral behavior which was contrary to God's moral law. Each of the three examples were irreligious, deserving, Jude says, of the wrath and judgment that they received. They pushed God aside They tried to set themselves in his place. And Jude is offering this sober warning. Listen, I know, statistically speaking, not everyone in this room is a Christian. And for those of you uh, who are here and trying to figure out if what you are hearing is true, again, I want to emphasize the fact that you are welcome here. We encourage you to keep asking questions and seeking answers to your questions about what the Bible says and what we believe as Christians and as a church. But I would fail in my responsibility as a pastor if I didn't point out that this text should serve as a warning. The God who created you, the God who offers to save you and forgive you for your rebellion against him, this God is not to be mocked. And he's not to be replaced. By all means, please ask your questions. But know that a day of righteous judgment is coming. And the only hope that you have, the only hope that any of us has, is in Jesus Christ. So it is our prayer that as you come and as you listen, God through his spirit will draw you to himself. That he will bring you to a place where you see your rebellion against him. That you have sought to put yourself on the throne that only he occupies. And that you will stop. You will will stop your rebellion and instead submit yourself to God. And take him up on his gracious offer to save you. Now can I speak for just a moment to those of you who are Christians. As believers we we would all nod our head in agreement to the warning of Jude. Those who rebel, those who revolt, those who rebel, yes, we might say with a sense of somberness, yes, those who do these things are in danger of God's wrath. Yet while there is a clear warning here for these, it's not the primary concern of Jude. It's not for these per se that this letter is written. No, there's another group, if you will, for whom Jude is writing and another matter more pressing and you get to it there at the beginning of verse 8 yet he writes in like manner these people also these people also well well, who are these people (laughs) great question the people that had creeped in among the beloved in the church were not irreligious but they were in danger of the same judgment And Jude is about to explain in greater detail, but let's go ahead and unmask them and then I'll explain. I want to suggest to you the group that had embedded themselves within the church were much more subtle and much more dangerous than the irreligious. I'm labeling them the irreligious. And yes, I know it's not really a word, but it makes the point and it makes for a better outline. So, the irreligious. These are they who put their judgment in God's place. Marked by their determination of others, they set themselves as the arbiters of righteousness and grace. Who's deserving, who's not? And again, Jude identifies them, gives us characteristics. He says they are those who reject the Lord's authority. The Lord's authority. 
in verse 8. Jude warns, they they don't recognize higher authorities. In other words, they they don't recognize authority outside of themselves. They depend on their own understanding and on their own gut. He goes on. They are those who reserve for themselves the right to judge. Verse 10. They live only by their instincts. They conform the truth to fit their actions. Instead of conforming their actions to fit the truth. They have just enough biblical knowledge to be dangerous, but then just move according to their own instincts. They don't check themselves. They become the plumb line by which all righteousness is judged. He gives three examples. He says it's illustrated by the life of Cain. Cain was the first murderer in scripture. He was looking out for himself and himself only. He says they make the same errors, error as that of Balaam. Who was Balaam? Balaam on the surface appeared to be a faithful prophet, but was actually leading God's people astray. That's what Numbers 31.16 tells us. Then also he says they're like Korah and his men. Korah and his men refused the God-ordained leadership of Moses and Aaron. Korah actually questioned God's wisdom and the leaders that he appointed. And then in verse 12, they look after their own interest, even at church suppers. If you have the ESV, you notice the word reef there. The word reef simply means blemishes. And Jude is saying these bad actors obscure the meaning behind the meal. These were love feasts where you gathered together to celebrate the love that you had in and through Jesus Christ. And he's saying the presence of these individuals, they are actually blemishes on the very purpose of the feast. They're not there out of love. They're they're there to serve themselves. Lastly, they are righteous are those who refuse the need for grace. They refuse the need for grace. Verse 16 says they're grumblers. They look to highlight the faults in others. They look to promote themselves for personal advantage. They withhold grace from others without recognizing their own need for it. And what makes the irrighteous so dangerous is that Jude is warning us that these individuals are actually our friends. Jude is saying they're in and among us. They run in our social circles. They may even teach our Bible studies. They may lead our small groups. They could hold positions in the church. They are not on the outside trying to get in. They are in. They're in. According to verse 4, towards the end, Jude says they speak of the gospel of grace, but grace does not constrain them in any way. Verse 16, Jude gives identity markers. He says they're grumblers, they're malcontents. Again, he says they follow their own sinful desires. They're loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. And according to verse 19, they claim to be filled with the Spirit, but ultimately they're just full of themselves. If I'm being brutally honest this morning, in our society today, we platform individuals like this. What we say and what we observe every day in our politics, it's actually now duplicated in the pews of our churches. These individuals justify their actions with words like this. It just hurts me so much to see the church I love. Fill in the blank. As if it is their church. It's Jesus' church. They don't hesitate to use scripture out of context to bolter their unbiblical positions. They hide behind anonymous emails and carefully circulated correspondences. And the result is the blind copying leading the blind. They cause division. They disturb the peace in the church. They are personally driven. They are not driven by the gospel. And Jude is warning the church to be aware, to be on guard. But you see, what makes this passage and this letter so important is that Jude is warning both the the irreligious and the irrighteous that they are two sides of the same 
coin. Both have ultimately rejected God's authority. Both have set themselves up as sovereign arbiters. The irrighteous are just as lost as the irreligious, but they don't realize it. And is in as much danger of judgment, but they don't want to hear it. And Jude is telling the church to be aware. And he's telling the irrighteous to be warned. It's a much needed letter with a much needed warning. But thankfully and graciously, he ends with a much needed blessing. You see it there in verses 20 through 25. And there's more to the blessing perhaps than first meets the eye. He encourages the readers of the letter to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's what he says in verse 3. And he tells us how we are to contend at the end of the short letter. And he does it through this blessing. But in contending for the faith, he writes to remind them to remember their dependence on the same faith. There's a sort of parallel that I think occurs between the contend and depend verses. Check me on this. See if I'm right. For instance, notice in verse 20. But you, beloved... Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. He's giving us something to do. How do you protect yourself against these things? You build yourselves up in your holy faith. You pray in the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying, contend. But now look down at verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. (laughs) Depend. You depend on Jesus Christ. Build yourself up, contend to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Depend. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Contend. Last part of verse 24. To the one who is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. You depend. You depend on him. Verse 22. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear. Contend, not just for yourselves, but contend for others. Verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Depend. You see, Jude's message to us is this. The only hope for any of us is not in our assuming the reign and the rights of God, but to depend wholly and solely on the redemption of God, his son, Jesus Christ. Because of the good news of Jesus Christ, we are reminded that it is he who is the one who actually restrains. He is able to keep us from stumbling. He is the one that is righteous. He is able to present us before the presence of his glory with great joy. And he is the one, he is the only one who rules and reigns. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Dear friends, let us not ever be deceived. Let's don't be led astray. Each of us needs to be warned, for each of us can easily seek to reject God altogether or to seek to put our judgment in the place of his. And both of these, both of these, both of these are deserving of judgment and wrath. But Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, lays out for us our need for salvation. And the Jesus he knew is the only one who can provide it. He is able to keep us from stumbling. And he alone is able to present us blameless before our Father in heaven. He alone is able to do this. He alone is our hope. That's the message that is much needed. He is our only hope. So let's turn and depend on him. And all glory be to Christ and to Christ alone, for he alone is worthy of it. Let's pray.
Father, I'm, I am very well aware that this is a hard message to hear. It's a hard message to preach. And yet it is a necessary message. We need to be warned. It is our tendency to try to push you off your throne and to put ourselves there in your place. Because if we're honest, we, we just think we've got some great ideas and how things could work better and who actually deserves perhaps mercy and then who doesn't. But that's not the way it works. You alone are sovereign. You are the one who is immortal, invisible, the only wise God. You are the one who is seated on your throne from before time began through creation through the fall, through the promising of your Messiah. You were the one who sent him to the cross to pay the debt for our rebellion. You were the one who raised him from the grave. You were the one who called him to yourself and allowed him to rise and ascend to sit at your right hand. You were the one who gives him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ alone is Lord. So, Father, I pray that you who control all things will bend our hearts to fit your will, that you will draw us to yourself, that you will make us thankful for the grace that you extend to us, that we will cease in our rebellion, in our irreligion, in our irrighteousness, and we will come to understand our total dependence on Christ. Because, Father, if you do that, the hopeless have hope, the faithless have faith, and we have strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. All glory be to Christ. Would you do this? Yes, for our benefit, but ultimately for your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name.